record. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to COVID-19, A Time to Heal. We are North Jersey alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. My name is Arielle Dance. I am one of the co-chairs of the Physical and Mental Health Committee. Um, and I am with my co-chair, Sharonda Johnson. I don't know if you wanna introduce yourself as well. Hi, good morning. I'm Sharonda Johnson, one of the co-chairs as well. And we are excited for today, um, especially for a time like this, right? We've been talking about this and we're excited and we do appreciate you coming to join us. Yes, and so we chose to do this event. We know how timely it is how important it is. We also recognize that some people were just a little nervous about returning to work, returning to school, returning to weddings and events that we were being invited to. And we wanted to bring the experts together and get some reassurance and answer some of those questions that were coming up, um, whether or not we should get our booster shot. Some people were on the fence about whether you should even get your first vaccine. And so um, we're gonna ask those questions today and get the expert opinions. And then also hear from some survivor caregiver. Um, we have a survivor caregiver here to share her story and hear about what that experience is like. We know a lot of people have experience of COVID yourself or with your loved ones. And so what was that like for you navigating that experience? And so we really wanna hear about what that experience is like, but really we want to know what that um, healing looks like. And so not just the physical healing, you know, we are going to talk about long haul COVID, but we're going to talk about healing mentally as well and spiritually as well. Um, so we're really excited to really navigate that and talk to you. But we also know that the news is talking about a variant. And so we're going to talk about that today as well. And so we originally were going to do this in September because we were like, oh, people are returning to work and returning to school. But really, December ended up being a little bit more timely than we thought. So we're really excited. Um, and we hope you have your notepads ready to take some notes, but we're also recording and you can share this information with your loved ones as well. So I'm gonna pass it to Sharonda. So, and I think primarily, thank you, Ariel, what Ariel said, the goal today is to focus on how do we capture information, get information and start steps to move forward. And we understand that those steps look very different for everyone. And I truly believe, you know, I appreciate the panelists and the experts um, coming on to share with us information in order to help us and what our journey looks like. So again, welcome. We're glad you're with us today. And I'm going to now, our SORA uh, North Jersey alumni chapter, our fantastic president is here with us. And I would like her to give us a few words this morning. Sorry, Good morning, Saras and, and guests. And we're just glad that you all could join in on this um, very important um, conversation today. Uh, I can't believe it's been like more than a year and nine months and we're still um, very much in the midst of um, this COVID-19 um, conversation and experience. And it has touched all our lives in some way, shape or form. So I'm excited about this discussion today and I wanna thank our partners for Meridian Health for joining in with us. And we look forward to uh, just an enlightening event and conversation. And I thank the co-chairs and the entire physical and mental health committee for bringing this to us today. So let's get out our notepads. I have mine out, I'm at work as we speak and this conversation comes up daily. So we so appreciate it. Just wanted to let you know I got my booster shot this week. So please encourage all your family and friends um, to get the boost that we need as we continue. Thank you, Sharonda. Thank you, Sora President. So now we'll have our phenomenal Sora Marilyn Williams from our Chaplains Council, because you want to just set the, the tone for today. If you can just open us up with an invocation. Yes, good morning. Would everybody please bow their heads? Thank you, Lord, for waking us up this morning. Thank you for this sunshiny day. Let it be a light unto our path, God. We thank you for all you've done for us. We acknowledge you and your wondrous works. And Lord, we thank you for another day to worship and serve you. 
thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be a vessel today through this webinar, COVID-19. It talks about healing our land. We thank you for allowing us to sponsor this webinar. And we ask you that we allow uh, our hearts and minds to be open to your will and your way. Give us wisdom and understanding. Open our hearts so that we can accept the words that are coming forth through Meridian and our experts and our speakers, God. Please allow us to just take in all that you have for us today, God. In your word, it says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then they will hear from heaven, and you will forgive us of our sins and heal our land. We're asking you this morning to heal our land, God. And in order to do that, we have to open our hearts and minds to hear and receive insight and wisdom. And we just thank you for this opportunity. We'll give you the honor, glory, and praise that, are, that is due you. And we just thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Sarah Williams. We appreciate th that prayer this morning for setting the tone for today. Now, let's get started. So it's a time for, again, so our focus is a time for healing. And we are grateful to have Hackensack Meridian and the panelists with us this morning. And I just want to introduce our moderator who serves two hats this today as part of Hackensack Meridian and also part of North Jersey Alumni Chapter. So our North Jersey Alumni Chapter SORA, Dr. Avanya Richardson Miller, is the Senior Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer at, at Hackensack Meridian Health. Under her leadership, Hackensack Meridian has achieved national recognition, ranking number 11 on the 2021 Diversity Inc. Top Hospitals and Health Systems list. She is also named as one of ROI in New Jersey's most influential diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders of 2021 and one of modern healthcare's top diversity leaders for 2021. She is a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, North Jersey alumni chapter, and she's my line sister. I would like everyone to welcome this morning our moderator for today, Sora Dr. Avanya Richardson. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sora Sharonda, for that um, introduction. And good morning, all of my Sorors, Madam President, um, co-chairs of this committee, our panelists, and all the guests that have joined us today. On behalf of Hackensack Meridian Health, the largest healthcare system in New Jersey, we are excited to have this opportunity to collaborate with the North Jersey alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated on this very important community outreach event. We thank the sorority and the physical and mental health committee for all that you do to help address the needs of our community and particularly the work that you do to help address health equity. As a member of this chapter, as my uh, line sister just mentioned, I am deeply honored to moderate today's discussion. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, Angela Butler, uh, COVID-19 survivor and caregiver. Um, she's a survivor, caregiver, wife, mother, proud grandmother, and the matriarch of the family. To Angela, surviving COVID means gratitude and grace, restorative grace, faith and favor, savory surrender, freedom and fighting. First, let me say, we are so grateful and thankful for the grace and mercy spared to you and for all the caregivers and clinicians that played a part in your healing. And thank you for joining us. And we look forward to hearing your survivor story today. 
Next, we have Lisa Eady. She's manager of social determinants of health from Hackensack Meridian Health. Um, Leslie Eady is a manager with the social determinants of health department at Hackensack Meridian Health. She has over 30 years of healthcare experience focusing on public and community health as well as social determinants of health, including a focus on health equity for communities of color. Leslie holds a master's in public um, health. She is a certified social worker and a master certified health educator and disaster response crisis counselor. She uses these skills to assist community members to become their own best healthcare advocates and champions to impact generational health. Leslie, thank you for joining us today. Your work and expertise covers so many areas related to all the complexities we must consider in a time to heal. We look forward to hearing from you. We have Dr. Rose St. Fleur, um, a pediatrician. Dr. St. Fleur is a pediatrician, clinical professor, and medical director of the Center for Breastfeeding at Hackensack Meridian Health, Jersey Shore University Medical Center in Neptune, New Jersey, which is a baby-friendly designated facility. She lectures throughout the country on breastfeeding management, lactation supporting practices, and pediatric health equity. Dr. St. Fleur completed her undergraduate studies in nutritional science at Cornell University, her graduate studies at the University of Rochester School of Medicine, and her pediatric training at the NYU Winthrop Hospital in New York. Thank you, Dr. St. Fleur, for joining us today. Children, teens, and women of childbearing age are areas of concerns that many um, have regarding the COVID max vaccine. So we look forward to hearing um, you share your knowledge and expertise in these areas. And Dr. David Koontz, Vice President, Academic uh, Diversity. Dr. David Koontz is an internal medicine physician at Hackensack Meridian Health, Jersey Shore University Medical Center, and the Vice President for Academic Diversity at Hackensack Meridian Health. He has spoken frequently to underrepresented groups since the start of the pandemic regarding why minorities have been disproportionately affected, vaccines, vaccine hesitancy, and boosters. So thank you, Dr. Kuntz, for joining us as one of our panelists today to share your knowledge and expertise on this uh, critically important topic. So that wraps up our introductions, and I'd like to jump right into today's discussions. I'm sure everyone is eager to hear from our distinguished panelists. Um, my first question is for um, Dr. St. Floor. Um, and it has uh, two parts. So uh, Dr. St. Floor, with children returning to school, uh, what should parents and guardians and educators know about the vaccine? Uh, that's the first part. And the second is why do children need to get vaccinated? And with that, you know, any thoughts you have about um, there being a vaccine mandate uh, to extend, attend school? Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Miller. And thank you, everybody, uh, for having me on this panel. I'm honored to be here. So uh, the we know, a lot of us know that the COVID vaccine is now available to children uh, ages five and up. Um, we have been looking at the effectiveness of the COVID vaccine actually since the beginning, um, something a lot of us may not know. Uh, the vaccine uh, first came out um, in January of last year, was studied uh, over the summer of last year, and those earliest studies did include a small group of children. And then that group of children expanded until we were able to determine that it is safe and effective in children 12 to 17. And in the spring of this year, um, the uh, Food, Drug and, uh, Food and Drug Administration uh, allowed for emergency use authorization or permission for children ages 12 to 17 to get the vaccine. And then now we know 
as of September of this year that children five to 11 can also get the vaccine. We know the vaccine is very, very well tolerated. Most children uh, have it uh, with no side effects even. Um, what we are seeing now in the hospital is that some kids don't even get the typical side effects that you will see with adults. But the side effects that we do tend to see for children who have it would be like a sore arm, some very mild flu-like illness, maybe some mild fever. Um, there have been some reports of a heart condition called myocarditis, which have occurred in some children. Very, very small numbers. In fact, the numbers are so small that we don't even have good data uh, to tell us how many children is happening. And I've seen it only once in the hundreds of kids who I have seen who have gotten uh, the vaccine already. Um, and of course, the many, many more that I have seen that have had COVID. And if uh, you do see it in children, um, it's more likely to occur in teenage males, and it tends to be very mild, lasting only about a day or two with a complete recovery. Um, we don't have any information yet about whether or not the vaccine will be mandated in schools. Um, in part because we are still really trying to get a handle of this pandemic overall, just looking at it from a much wider perspective, a global perspective. And so when you do see any information or reports about vaccine mandates, it's really focused on populations who have the much highest, the highest risk of not just acquiring COVID, but also passing it on to vulnerable populations. And the most vulnerable populations still are the older adults, 65 and older, and those with comorbid conditions like obesity, uh, lung disease, heart disease, and so on. So that actually excludes children for now. So there is nothing in the news, nothing behind the scenes about making them required for schools. And I don't anticipate that that's going to be the case. I anticipate that if anybody is required it probably will be some segments of the adult population like what we're seeing right now. Thank you for that response. Is there anyone else on the panel that may have wanted to weigh in on this question? Okay. All right. Okay, if, if not, we're going to move on to uh, our next question. So next question is uh, for you, Dr. Kuntz. Um, so, um, what should we know about the booster shot? Um, and um, what, uh, if you could speak to anything about the uh, stigmas uh, related to receiving the shot, um, anything relating to the, to the new variant or long haulers, and even now that we're in, in flu season and many people are getting the flu shots, and if you could kind of like hit on those topics as it relates to um, what, we, what we should know about the booster shot. Sure, thank you, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Miller, and thank you mm -hmm. to the chapter for inviting me to participate. I was so happy to hear the chapter president start by talking about her uh, just getting the booster because that will be important for all of us on this panel. Uh, what, we, what we know is uh, over maybe after six months of an individual receiving their second dose of one of the two dose vaccines, Pfizer or Moderna, or six months after receiving the J&J &J vaccine, that the protection afforded by the vaccine starts to go down. Now, we know that because in our hospitals, we started to see more and more people who've been fully vaccinated uh, being admitted. And so if, if you had asked me four or five months ago who's in the hospital, it would have only have been people who are unvaccinated. Now we're seeing people more and more who have been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, but it was earlier in the when they had the opportunity to get vaccinated. So we, we really do realize that the vaccine protection starts to go down. We can't predict easily who uh, who's most vulnerable, but it stands to reason that older individuals, people with chronic conditions, uh, those who are obese or overweight, but actually a lot of uh, otherwise seemingly healthy mid midlife people are also um, coming down with COVID after two doses. So it, it really speaks to the importance of, of boosters. Um, uh, I, I appreciate that there is hesitancy, not only about boosters, but about the original shots. And people are saying, well, doesn't that mean the vaccine doesn't work? And I think as leaders, all of us, we need to educate our colleagues, our family members to say, 
the vaccine does work. If you develop COVID after uh, you've been vaccinated, it's likely to be much less severe. So it's not a sign that the vaccines don't work. It's just a fact that uh, the vaccine protection just starts to go down a little bit. We have to get a flu shot every year. We may in the future you know, need a COVID shot every year, but we're still just learning about, uh, about that uh, full history. Uh, the timing of this question is really important with the Omicron variant that you've all been reading about. This was identified in South Africa right around Thanksgiving, although like these other variants, it's probably been around the world in different places for weeks before that. And I think I read this morning that the first case has been identified in New Jersey. So no doubt it is going to come to our state. There's more, much more we don't know about it than we do know. Uh, we don't know yet uh, if it's more infectious or transmissible, although unfortunately there's some signals that uh, it, it is more transmissible. It just took a few weeks for it to really gain a foothold in South Africa. So we'll have to watch that carefully. We also don't know for sure if it uh, may elude our vaccines or if you've had COVID some degree of natural immunity. I was reading uh, some comments from our chief uh, scientific officer at Hackensack Meridian Health, Dr. David Perlin uh, this morning. Um, he's hopeful that if uh, people contract the Omicron variant, it'll be more mild, but I think we all still have to acknowledge it's, it's still too early to tell. What we do know will protect us further goes back to boosters. So if not just for what's going on already with the Delta variant and a lot of COVID that's still out there, protection from that with a booster, uh, the booster uh, seems also to be the best thing we have available to protect us if this new variant gains a foothold. Thank you, Dr. Koontz, and um, so timely to, to get this, uh, your insights and, and, and this expert information about this new variant. Um, can you also speak about, you know, what if a person has had COVID, um, uh, should they, you know, when should they get vaccinated? Uh, let's say they, let's say they haven't, they're not vaccinated yet, so not even at a point of a booster and they've had COVID, when should they get vaccinated? they should get vaccinated almost as soon as possible. I mean, we originally thought that there was some degree of natural immunity for some period of weeks or months. I think the more, more contemporary thinking is, as long as you don't have active infectious symptoms, as you're recovering, you should get vaccinated. Unfortunately, there's no um, clear pattern to know whether someone really has enough natural immunity to protect them from a subsequent infection. Um, we had used a, an, a, a, an approach that many, many of you remember called uh, convalescent plasma, if you remember that. So we were drawing blood from people who had COVID and uh, getting their antibodies and injecting them to people who were sick as a way to treat COVID. And we've moved a little bit away from that because it's not a predictable uh, or necessarily the best way to, to treat someone with COVID. So this idea of I've had COVID, I, I have immunity, I don't need the vaccine. I think we've, we've really moved away from that line of thinking. And we're recommending that even if you've had COVID, uh, please go ahead and get vaccinated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, that follow-up response too. Um, so, so back to you for this question, Dr. St. Floor. Um, it's related to uh, the vaccine as well. Um, can you speak to any long-term health impacts it, um, it may cause? And with this, um, you know, anything related to what you may know about uh, fertility or breast health? Yes, thank you. That's a great question. So again, this is a new pandemic. Uh, we just learned about the COVID-19 virus in 2019. However, it is not, um, it, it has its relatives. We have had uh, variants and relatives in particular, uh, one that was called SARS and another one that was called MERS that did exist and, and, and had much smaller pandemics, but with impact to human health many years ago. So looking at some of that research, plus the research that we have now on COVID-19, 
we're not fully aware of what the long-term side effects of the virus will be um, on human health. Um, however, there still, there has never been, and there still continues to be no research that shows that COVID-19 or the vaccine, uh, oh, sorry, the COVID-19 vaccine, let me say that specifically, has any impact on fertility or on breast health for women or for men, the vaccine specifically. Um, there is a small amount of research that suggests that the, vac the disease, the COVID-19 disease, and we have seen this with other cousins of COVID, can impact fertility. We do know that COVID-19 disease, for example, is more likely to cause premature delivery in pregnant women. We suspect, although the research is still quite small, that COVID-19 disease has increased chances of stillbirth also in pregnant women. And that the disease can potentially impact fertility in men, potentially. Very small research, preliminary, we need a lot more information. But as far as the vaccine goes, the COVID-19 vaccine, there has never been any research or literature to support any negative impact of the vaccine on uh, fertility, on breast, on breast health, on breastfeeding, any of that. It only in fact, if anything, we should we know that the vaccine is obviously very beneficial in terms of preventing the disease itself. In terms of other um, symptoms related to COVID-19 disease, long-term impact related to COVID-19 disease. We are studying that right now in pediatrics. Uh, we do have, there are several clinics that have popped up throughout the country and Hackensack has one that is looking at long haul COVID in children and what that looks like and how it looks like, you know, compared to adults, it is slightly different. Um, we do see that the disease, if it causes long haul COVID can have a negative impact on academic health. We have seen some early research suggesting some impacts on executive functioning, on some behavior. Um, we have seen uh, some uh, recurrent symptoms that have returned, including sometimes even fever um, and headaches separate from MIS-C, which is another disease process, which I can talk about later. So we do see a little bit of that, but again, these are very, very small groups um, and we still need to know more about uh, that. And that is connected not to the vaccine to be clear, but to COVID-19 uh, disease. Thank you, Dr. St. Floor. And so my takeaway from that question is not so much uh, are we seeing as far as long-term impact from, from the, or side effects from the vaccine, but a long laundry list from the actual yes. disease itself, right? Yes, yes. So thank you. Um, so this, we, we, we're gonna move in right now to, uh, to a question focused around uh, mental health questions. So, so this uh, question, we're going to look to hear a response from, from both um, Leslie and uh, Angela from your different perspectives. And uh, the question is, uh, we'll, we'll go with uh, you first, Leslie, and then um, Angela. Um, how can someone support a loved one with uh, COVID-19? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for having me this morning. Um, what I see in support, most importantly, I have to say what I have learned um, in our almost two years of COVID is that providing support begins with offering words of kindness, respect, grace, and affording folks the space to vent and talk about things and talk them completely through. Support also looks like what your loved one needs for it to look like. It's not what you need it to look like. Traditionally, that could mean also food shopping, simple things, cooking meals, assisting with childcare and care for parents. And the overarching piece I cannot emphasize, support means reserving judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank that's you. what it looks like to me, yes. Thank you. And um, so do you see, um, when, when you think about that versus the right now, caregiving someone for COVID, and then versus in a distant future, as we think about this in a time to heal? You know, um, especially as, as things are evolving, I'm seeing them look the same. I know that there will be that space that we will have to adjust 
we will have to make that space again for how it adjusts. We just have to kind of play it by ear, if you will, um, to be able to be to pivot, if you will, as we need to pivot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, COVID has certainly taught us all how to pivot and to be flexible, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> So thank you for, for, for that response, uh, Leslie. And uh, Angela, uh, we, we'd love to hear from you, um, your thoughts on this question. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for having me as the panelists. Good morning. Good morning. Um, a good supporter for me and being a good supporter would be um, first and for, foremost is prayer. Definitely prayer, um, pray over everything and about everything. Um, being a good listener as well, because um, during this time of COVID, we was forced to sit down and listen and listen to the many thoughts that um, came across, that came in our minds, um, that came in the minds of other people. And people just needed to talk. Family just needed to talk. So listening was good as well as serving as well as serving. Yes, just like it was just said, as far as going to the supermarket for someone, dropping things off for someone, we actually had, you know, people were scared to go out to supermarkets and different places, you know, to get their food. So, you know, definitely uh, serving and being patient, being patient, just having to even go out. I encountered um, many uh, people who didn't want to go back out anymore. You know, this, this seclusion, this isolation had um, really messed up their mental thoughts. So lots of prayer had to go back to it. I still come back to prayer. That's how I support during this COVID season. Thank you. Yes, and, and, and I, I amen to that. Um, and we will definitely need that. We need that now and for the long term, for sure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Angela, so we want we want to stay with you right now, Angela, mm -hmm. and um, I think um, with the comments that you just gave, is it's, it's a great opportunity for you to segue into sharing um, with us, uh, you know, a little bit uh, uh, about um, talk about how to balance um, having being a person who is dealing with being, um, you know, suffering from the virus of COVID-19, and then at the same time, having the responsibilities of taking care of your family are responsibilities. What is that like? What was that like for you and your experience? Well, what it was like for me and my experience, and um, again, I want to say thank you to the um, alumni chapter Delta uh, Sigma Theta sorority, as well as the Hackensack Meridian, uh, this prestigious panelists and survivors, because we are all survivors on here, um, the lovely moderator, and a shout out to Dr. Ariel Dance, thank you, and to your very own and my friend, your Sora, Faith Egger, who put my name on the list to be on this panelist. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna make sure, is this my turn to go ahead? This and is your time, this is your All time. Right. <laughs> so here we go. Well, you see, I have on the t-shirt, I pray. So first of all, that is how I balance and learn to balance. Um, how to um, live in this COVID season as well as informing and teaching others. So let me just take you on this timeline and just give me uh, a couple of uh, minutes, not too long. Timeline starting from March, 2020 to um, going into 2021. So I was just told by uh, my doctors um, that the cancer had returned and I had to go back and receive treatments after two years um, I had been cancer free. And so, you know, that was a very hard decision, not an easy decision. Um, at this time in March, we know that COVID was real. It had hit us, you know, really hard. We were seeing the news and everything was coming on and just, it was just not a good time for the world. So I also work in the healthcare uh, field. So in the healthcare field, you know, um, you see the many cases that was coming in due to COVID. And I also experienced the many confused faces as well that was going on. So I had to still figure out, am I going to go into these hospitals, another hospital and take this, uh, the chemo treatment. So my husband and I, we prayed over it. And yes, I did take, um, 
the, the treatments. Um, but this time I said, when I go in there, that it wasn't gonna be like the first time. First time I went in there, I was quiet, very private, you know, my family, very close family and very close friends only. But this time I knew I had to fight. I had to be that fighter. I had to not just only be that fighter for me, but I really kind of took on the world as on my shoulders too. So when I went in there and they hooked up the treatments and, and did what they had to do, um, I just began to, to praise and, and worship. That's what I did. I called on one of my uh, sisters in ministry, which is um, Faith Edgar, and that's what we did. I set up a Zoom, and we worshiped, and we praised, and um, and we prayed, and, you know, what experience it was. And so that reached over, not just for me, to, but even all the other people that was in there receiving the chemotherapy at this time, and also being in the hospital without your loved ones, because there was no visitors at this mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and we know that. So, um, so that's what was going on with me. Thank God you see me here. I am a survivor and I am here as well as others. And so then after that, um, uh, we fought through this thing, me and my husband and I, and um, we, we fought through praise, we fought through worship, and we just st stood just like the, the, the song says, after you did everything you could do, you just stand. And so that's where we just stood. And we just stood on the word of God and on his promises. And so from there, um, God gave me um, a, another way to use Zoom in this way with my family. And through Zoom, what we did was um, we created a praise and worship um, uh, like forum, you would say. And we just had a good time in there. We had our service and healing begin to come. We begin to listen to one another. We, we, we pray with one another. We, and, and most importantly, we lift up the Lord because we knew that's where I help come from. And so um, it gave me great joy to see my family on the line like this, um, just having a good time with each other. And so that's how we kind of balanced off um, as well. Um, then after that, months has have passed um we we got into it was uh thanksgiving had to be creative about thanksgiving had to be creative about um christmas we got through all of those and, and it was good and then um we go into january thank you lord 2021 another year we're gonna make it right we're gonna do right and you know the whole thing that was uh still going on my my daughter got married in february you have the decisions on whether you should go or whether you you shouldn't go or you know things like that um uh, wasn't a big decision for me because i was going but you know those things because i mentioned someone did mention earlier about you know weddings was even one decision and yes that that is true you have to think about all those things. So wedding comes and then, you know, Easter comes. Thank you, Lord. We've been resurrected. And then we find out that COVID hits our house, hits our house. Mm. Wow. My mother in love, my brother in love, me and my husband. We had no idea. We had no idea. First, my mother-in-law went to the hospital first. She went in there, we still had no other idea. Second day later, we took my brother-in-law. We still had no idea. The COVID test had not been taken for two days. I had to request for one. So at this time, visitation was a little bit, you could kind of come in now. Mm -hmm. So now we're going in, but they have COVID now and we get COVID. So mm -hmm. now, all four of us experiencing COVID, we have to deal with these decisions with seeing them and going down there and dealing with doctors and questions and answers and, and staff shortages and all that kind of stuff that goes on. And, you know, at that same time, being a caregiver, trying to do the best that you can, trying to ask every question that you can, trying to get these answers and put them in such an order that you, you're, you want to make right choices, wise choices. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we go through that and, 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 and then we find out that, you know, I had it too and I, I have to go to the hospital. But I vowed I wasn't sitting in that hospital. At that time, we was fortunate enough. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for his, his grace, for his grace. My husband and I was yes. able to get the, the shot. Um, it's a shot for those who doesn't have severe um, 
uh, COVID, the shortening was BAM. That's what I can remember. I'm sure one of the specialists on here could you know, expand on that, but it was called BAM. And before I could even get it, I had to pass the test because my O2 sats was down to like in the 40s and the 50s, which is supposed to be up in the 95 <laughs> percent and over. So I did that. Um, he told me all I had to do was run a little bit for a little bit while. So I ran for my life, literally. <laughs> I said, okay, they got the right person here. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I praise, I worship, I'm a dancer. I'm going to run. I'm going to run. And so I ran for my life. And after that, I was able to receive the shot and it worked. And it worked. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the doctors. Yes. Thank you for the, the nurses, everyone that was in there that came to my aid. It worked. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. So that was some of the things that convinced me too, as far as, because I'm still weighing on in too, should I be taking this vaccine shot? Because remember, I had to wait. I just had the, 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 the chemotherapy, so I couldn't mix all this stuff all together, so I had to wait. At the same time, I'm checking out everybody, everybody that got the shot. I'm looking at it, seeing what's happening, seeing what's going on. Already falling out. They already got fever. Mm -hmm. Whatever the symptoms may be, I'm checking it out. And I found out that it was okay, that everybody I've seen, everybody that I'm around, everybody that I've worked with, was, was doing okay. You had your mild, your mild uh, symptoms, you know, and some maybe went to a week of some, some trepidation, but they came out okay. So it was okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I say this to tell you that with this, the vaccine for me is okay to take. Thank I, you. It was my yeah. own look at it in praise and words. Yes. Amen. Angela, thank you so much for, for yeah. sharing your story. I feel like I'm coming out of church right now. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what, what a powerful testimony. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, uh, something that, you know, stays at the forefront of my mind is uh, let your faith be bigger than your fear. And, and, and that's what I heard all throughout right. your, your testimony. And, and as you wrapped up and, and your comments about the vaccine and um, how you were thinking about your own health and watching others, um, I, I, I think I, I'm fully vaccinated and have had my booster shot. And, and, I, and that's one of the things that, that I say too, I think that it's an individual choice in that we really sh need to take into account our own um, benefits analysis, risk benefits analysis that relates to whatever our own personal circumstances are and, and, and make what educate ourselves about this and make what we feel is the best choice that we, that, that we can, we can make. But, um, you know, we are thankful and grateful for you sharing your story you. and for your healing. Thank you so much. So, um, I think we're moving back into, um, uh, with a question for uh, Leslie. Um, so um, this is about um, how can someone uh, navigate when it's the right time to return to normal activities? So um, how to move forward, but still be safe? That's a good question. First, I wanna say, um, taking a moment to assess your personal needs in a professional space is a big thing. Uh, my mom is a church administrator. So she has been in her job since day one, but she had to rethink how she did that in her space. It's a personal and a professional choice. I encourage you all to take a moment to do a self-assessment of what you are and aren't comfortable with personally as you prepare to return to work. Go through what a pre-pandemic day in the office would be like for you. Where would you enter the building, prepare your coffee or your tea, those things that you did out of habit, have lunch, hold meetings, and exit at the end of the day. Identify the actions you may need to modify to be in line with CDC guidelines as well as your own comfort area right now. 
from there identify items that while may have been normal routine before, seemingly bring you some anxiety or concern in current times. Are there ways you yourself can modify these activities to ease your own anxiety? Maybe you can bring your own coffee or tea from home instead. Then identify things that you may need to seek guidance from your company, such as holding virtual meetings as we are in Zoom time, even though your team members may be physically present, having lunch at your desk or shifts in the lunchroom, or even the ability to work on a hybrid schedule if you need. That draws down to, you need to make a personal assessment, figure out if what your employment or your employment situation looks like for you. If it's not in line, then there are decisions that need to be made. Thank you. I think thank you so much for 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 that um, advice and those recommendations. Um, so our, our our final question bef uh, before we're going to get to some um, some final comments from our panelists is um, for Dr. Saint Floor, and um, it's regarding uh, socialization with schools and uh, returning to school. Um, can you can you speak about the mental and emotional health of of our youth from from that perspective? Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, so uh, of course, as many of us know, and, and in particular for those of us who have had children who, who lived through it, I, I had two children and I lived through it. We all remember that day when we were told without warning really that your kids cannot come back to school and that we would be switching over to remote learning. That didn't even happen right away as many of us recall. And then the process to remote learning without any kind of background um, or foundation in place, we were really learning as we went along and lots of errors were made, lots of successes. But there was plenty of time for um, learning to really, really slow down. And there is some research looking at this, like, you know, what has been the impact of COVID and 2020 on uh, learning in children? And we are finding that on average, children have slowed down with their academic learning by as much as a year. Mm -hmm. um, in some settings, some situations, it's gone down by only six months, which is still a lot because, you know, children grow pretty quickly. Um, but in some situations, it's been a year or more. And unfortunately, not a surprise, those from low resource uh, communities, African Americans, Hispanic populations and indigenous populations are more affected. So they are the ones that are showing this academic decline, um, lagging and falling behind by about, like I said, 12 months or so. And this is significant because this is 12 months lost. We cannot get it back. We can't just have a child repeat a grade or some do summer school or something, you know, it's, it's there and it's highly unlikely that we're going to get that back. And there is still the risk of us going back to remote learning if we can't get this pandemic con under control. All the more reason why those of us in the science community are eager to try to manage COVID and get it under control as quickly as we can for the sake of our children. And it's, it should never be underestimated. It's not just the academic impact. The actual lack of ability to go to school, right, is considered academic impact. There's also the reentry stress, which was, was major for a lot of kids. They were remote for so long. Now they're suddenly in a crowd of people where they have not really been in crowds because we've all been in quarantine. That was a huge source of stress and anxiety for a lot of children, in particular, our younger children who were not very socialized as they normally were accustomed to being, that now they're suddenly in big, big classrooms with a lot of kids. So many teachers did report on that. There's also the emotional impact of the pandemic itself. You know, if as adults, we are relying so heavily on prayer uh, to help us get through the pandemic. You can just imagine how it is for a child who has lower resilience and who just simply 
cannot understand no matter how much you try to explain to them. This is significant. We see this in the hospital. I work in a hospital every single day. I am a hospital medicine doctor on top of the work that I do with breastfeeding. And we definitely absolutely see children that come in with depression, anxiety, even suicidal behaviors because of the stress of the pandemic itself on top of the academic stress, the pressure to try to catch up, the tre- the pressure to try to get 11th grade work done when you really <laughs> never had a 10th grade, all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, many of our children have lost lo- loved ones to COVID or have witnessed loved ones suffer uh, from being hospitalized with COVID without knowing if they will ever see their loved ones another day. So the memory of that and the PTSD from that also. Mm-hmm. So putting it all together, uh, the toll on children goes well beyond even just the academic toll. There's also this social and emotional burden that we need to consider and make sure that we remember um, that our kids are going through this right now. Thank you so much. You've given us so much to think about and some, 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 some that I had was, was on my mind and some that um, you raised the awareness for the first time with me. So there is so much to do in, 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 as we focus on this time to heal. Uh, I just want to check in right now with the co-chairs to see, um, I know there have been some questions coming in from the chat, whether or not we have opportunity to take some of those questions before we move into the final comments from the panelists, or um, are we um, tight on time? Um, we did get a couple, some were answered, oh, okay, um, great. some we may not have answers to necessarily, but I'll okay. read them to you. And mm-hmm. if we want to answer them in the chat, that's okay as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we just, one of the questions was if someone received the J and J vaccine and they're trying to make a decision about the booster, um, how do they make that decision about mixing vaccines? So why don't I make, uh, make a comment about that, it's Dr. Mm-hmm. Coons. I don't think it really matters. Uh, you can uh, you can either receive Pfizer or Moderna. Uh, I'm not sure we have a lot of data to know exactly is one better than the other, but they're both approved to be uh, received as a booster. So I think whatever is most convenient and practical and the one you can frankly get a little sooner, just go up to your pharmacy, uh, your doctor's office or another location and get the booster that's available. Thank you. Okay, perfect. And then uh, one more similar kind of is if, I just wanna make sure I get the timeline right. If you received the vaccine and then tested positive for COVID after the vaccine, how long should you wait to get the booster? So again, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't see a need to wait unless you're having active COVID symptoms. I think you should just move pretty quickly uh, to get vaccinated, so. Uh, if you're actively ill, I don't think it's a good idea to get a vaccine or a vaccine booster. But if your symptoms have resolved, uh, I would go ahead and get that booster. Perfect. And then we had some health specific questions to which I will generally say, if you're actively not feeling well right now, please call your PCP um, or reach out to someone, um, one of your healthcare providers or go get a COVID test if you're worried. All right. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and thank you, um, Dr. Coons, for addressing those questions that came in. Um, There's so, one more question. I just oh, sorry. To, I just wanted to, I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure. And it was talking about a future vaccine regarding the Omicron variant. I'm not sure if it was addressed, okay. but I know I hear that often. Mm-hmm. I know it's, you know, forecasting a bit ahead, but, you know, what are your thoughts and uh, around that at this time? So we, so I think you're right. I think it's, it's a little premature to know definitively. I think that our ability, uh, the scientific community's ability to generate new vaccines is pretty incredible today. It, it may still take three to six months. And I am also hearing that several of the vaccine manufacturers are getting ready to prepare a, an Omicron you know, variant vaccine. But because we don't yet know if it's gonna become a dominant vaccine, I, I think it's still prudent to just kind of wait and see. But uh, but it's possible to, you know, to to make a variation of the current vaccine, just like we make variations of the flu vaccine. So it's it it may be in the future. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are are there any others? No. Okay. All right. So then, at this time, uh, we, we want to hear from our panelists. Um, and for your final comments. And uh, if you can wrap up your final comments in about uh, two minutes, uh, that would be great. We will start with, um, with, with Angela.
Hello again. Mm -hmm. um, I would just like to say, um, and it's coming right from Philippians 4, 8, because um, even whatever decision that we make for ourselves, for our children, that um, impacts the world, we have to think, and it's um, important for our, our mental uh, focus to be in alignment. So it says from Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I leave you with that scripture in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, that's a tough one to follow, but uh, Leslie, you're on. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. <laughs> Uh, my takeaway um, is always is such a, a plainly spoken thing. Take a moment to breathe. Again, COVID has changed our everyday lives in ways we never would have imagined. We are all experiencing these changes, trials, and discomfort together. We now live in a time where instead of offering blessings when someone sneezes or coughs, we receive a side eye. Last year I had a health scare and I went to the doctor and my niece went with me and she was five and she sneezed and all the adults in the room looked at her. And she said in her five-year-old words, I don't have COVID, it's just an allergy. You know, it's the onus is placed on us to explain what's going on. This is our reality. It can be quite overwhelming. It has been overwhelming, but it's achievable. And to Angela and to all, through prayer and being kind as human beings and being understanding and exercising grace that we would have never imagined is key to anything that we do in interacting and engaging with human beings. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to uh, Dr. St. Floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much to everybody. This was, uh, Angela, I just want to just shout out to you. Your story was so beautiful and inspirational. I'm so happy that you gave an opportunity, everyone an opportunity to listen and hear your experiences. I'm so grateful that you have recovered. I hope that the rest of your family has recovered as well. Um, so my, my takeaway uh, is also to breathe with a mask on when you're in public. <laughs> <laughs> and you're around large groups of, I just had to say it like that. <laughs> when you're around large groups of people, if you, and if you are in public and you are in a place where there is a crowd, please put on your mask and put it above your nose and, and then breathe. And then, um, <laughs> so, and then my other <laughs> takeaway um, is, is really just to, um, you know, keep your mind open, keep your mind open to the education and information there is out there. There is so much and it comes so fast. It can be overwhelming even for us as physicians. I encourage as you continue to learn about this disease and pandemic, you learn from reputable sources. As we all know, they're not all the same. Um, the recommendations I always give everybody is to use the CDC, the, that's the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization for Children, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists for pregnant women and women of childbearing age. Um, really make sure that as you're gathering information about this disease that you go to the sources uh, where the experts are, those that are studying this and literally studying this as a living every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are the ones who really do know what is happening and then use that information to make an educated and informed decision. It's exactly what I did for myself and for my family. I am triple vaccinated and I can absolutely tell you the very first time I got vaccinated, I was praying right through that entire experience from start to finish. It was frightening and I'm a physician and I know the research and I've read the research but that did not mean that I didn't carry that fear that I needed God to help me through. The same with my second vaccine, the same with my third, the same when I vaccinated my 14 year old the first time and the second time, the same time, the same when I vaccinated my 10 year old just a couple of weeks ago, when I recommended that my family members get double or triple vaccinated, all of that. Um, and so it's the combination of the information that I have learned, that education and the prayer that helped get me through. 
And then I encourage you guys to all do the same thing to make sure that you are acquiring your information and your resources from the places uh, with the people that have the medical expertise to know, and then use that to make whatever best decision that you feel is right for you and your family. Thank you, Dr. St. Floor, and, and, and thank you for sharing so much about your personal experience um, and, 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 how you, and how you processed a decision about the vaccine for yourself and, and, your, and your children and family as well. Um, so, Dr. Kuntz, to you. Sure. Thank you, uh, and again, my, my thanks to everybody, really an ins inspiring last hour. Uh, I also remember the day I got my three vaccinations. I heard from our two adult sons that they were vaccinated. I heard my mother in Connecticut that she got vaccinated and my wife got vaccinated. And those are really wonderful days. And, and I think uh, I share Dr. St. Fleur's comments about a little bit of anxiety, but knowing it was important to accomplish. I wanted to leave you with just remembering all aspects of your health. Uh, I'm an adult uh, general physician and unfortunately, in the last year and nine months, I've seen uh, can uh, cases of cancer that were not recognized and people have been admitted with advanced, often untreatable cancer, diabetes out of control, evidence of heart disease because they didn't come in or get checked out when they had some symptoms weeks or months before. We realize it's anxiety provoking to think about going to the hospital or even to a doctor's office. Um, but a lot of doctors have telemedicine that might be a good way for you to get back. And if you know there's a family member who should have gotten her breast cancer screening or he should have gotten his colon or prostate cancer screening and they've delayed it for a couple of years, um, as, you, as we come upon uh, New Year's resolutions, let's make sure that we're keeping ourselves and our family members healthy. This pandemic will recede at some point and we wanna be left with otherwise mm -hmm. good health. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kuntz, for that. And I think felt like you were speaking directly to me on that. I am guilty. I am not on point with all of my health screenings and tests that I need to have. And actually was just thinking about that this morning. It went across my mind. So um, you know what? Uh, I, I think that your closing comments was, was such for a reason. Um, so thank you for that. And I just want to say thank you so much to um, my line sisters, Ariel, Ariel and Sharonda, uh, and the co-chairs, who are also the co-chairs for this committee, for uh, reaching out to Hackensack Meridian Health um, and for our president for um, you know, seeking a collaboration with us on this, uh, on this community outreach effort. It is truly uh, ha has been our privilege at Hackensack Meridian Health to partner with the Delta Sigma Theta in North Jersey the alumni chapter um, on this cause. And so, and I did share this uh, and, and had a conversation even with our CEO and uh, with our, our, our chief human resources person about the, uh, the collaboration we were doing on this uh, specific, this very important um, webinar. So I wanna thank you. And I want to turn it back over to the co-chairs. Thank you so much, Ivania. This was amazing. Thank you to all our panelists for sharing so authentically and openly. And honestly, we really appreciate all of your um, information. I just wanted to turn everyone's attention to the chat. There are some resources there for you. Um, CDC, uh, New Jersey specific hotlines that you can call um, in our service area at Essex, Hudson and Union. I included the websites for where to get your vaccines or testing. So you can um, check those out. And then our survey for feedback for today's event. So if you can please fill that out, we want to hear if this was informational um, and what other topics you'd like for the physical and mental health committee to cover. Um, and thank you again to Hackensack Meridian Health and to our survivor caregiver, um, Ms. Angela. Absolutely. Sharonda, did I catch everything? I think you caught everything. Thank you again, everyone. And you know, if nothing else, I know it's so much going on. This is a lot, but just remember to be kind to yourselves and self-care as you're going along this journey is key. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful, wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.